I don't the same. All right. Thank you very much. Thank everybody for coming back. Uh, so yesterday, let me remind you real quick, sort of what we did. Oops. Hey. What we did yesterday was introduce Hurwitz numbers in pretty broad generality as this counts of maps of renal surfaces. Uh, we pointed out that they satisfy these things called the degeneration formulas that allows you to reconstruct all Hurwitz numbers inductively albeit in a pretty messy way because combinatorics is messy, from Hervis numbers that count maps to P1 that ramify over exactly three points. And then we focused on a couple special families of Hervis numbers, single and double Hervis numbers. These are counting maps to P1, so rational functions from Riemann's surface of genus G, where you specify either a divisor of pole or the full divisor of zero and divisors of poles, and then the remaining ramification is simple. And these are special because they have sort of structural properties that are very interesting, like uh, the simple, simple Hervis numbers are polynomial, double Hervis numbers are piecewise polynomials, and then they have this structure which for single Hervis numbers is captured by this ELSV formula that expresses them as an intersection number in the moduli space of curves. And there's a conjecture that says, we should do the same for double Hurwitz numbers, um, but it's an open conjecture. So today we have two talks, and, and we're going to be in vastly different uh, time zones for the two talks. Right now we're going to go to the tropics, right? We're going to spend the whole hour talking about this tropical geometric approach to Hurwitz theory. And then um, in, uh, in the, the afternoon we go back to Canada and say, spend the whole hour between logs, right? So um, let's start without further ado. So I'm going to you know, assume that you have never seen or heard anything about tropical geometry. I'm going to ask Margarita for forgiveness, uh, or Omid as well. He's not here yet, so good. I don't have to ask him for forgiveness. Um, any other tropical here? No? Uh, and so if you've never seen tropical geometry, for me, a tropical curve with genus G and N mark point is a metric graph, right? So a graph with something with vertices and edges. It has metric in the sense that um, every edge has a length. Uh, it has a number of infinite Ns labeled, right? So this N equals two means I have these two infinite Ns that I label with one and two. Uh, and it has a genus function assigned to vertices, so every vertex is given a non-negative integer that's supposed to be a genus. Right? And then the total genus of the tropical curve is obtained by taking the sum of all the values of the genus function of the various vertices plus the Betty number of the graph, so plus the number of cycles of the graph. Right? So, so the lengths can be sort of in whatever your favorite monoid is uh, traditionally. They've been like taken as real numbers because then you know the, the spaces have like a nicer topology. But there's a whole bunch of literature where you want to do your favorite monoid, you can, right? Mm -hmm. So if you if you start from an algebraic curve which is embedded in some toric variety. Right? Um, and you interpret, you know, uh, for example, as a hypersurface, so you have an equation and you interpret that tropically, then what you get is a special kind of this kind of object. Um, it will have more structure that I have removed now because it will have like an embedding into a, a plane, right? And so it will have um, you know, sort of this extra thing called the balancing condition. It will have ends going to infinity that don't correspond to mark ends. Um, and so what I'm doing right now, I'm sort of distilling like, like you know, historically we went from like um, in embedded manifolds to abstract manifold. This is the version, the abstract version. So I'm just retaining sort of some of the invariants that I want to remember. A black vertex means genus zero. Sorry? A black vertex means genus yes. zero. Yes, yeah, thanks for, yeah. Uh, I'm so used to this convention that I forget mentioning. If a vertex, I, instead of like putting a little number in, it's just a black, that's genus zero. That's a rational vertex. Okay. And of course, if you're familiar with the moduli space of curves, right? Oh, sorry. And then I did not put the word stable here, but 
there's a stability condition that you can impose that says any black vertex, any rational vertex, must have valence at least three. And so at this point, you recognize that these abstract tropical curves, if you're familiar with MGM bar, they're just dual graphs to stable curves, plus this is additional information that edges can have limits. Great. So those are combinatorial sort of objects, but somehow related to sort of some of the structure of curve that we like to remember. Um, if you say, okay, let me fix a topological type of a tropical curve, so let me fix the graph, the genus function, and everything else, but let me consider all possible lengths that the edges can take, and then the parameter space of, tro of abstract tropical curves of fixed topological type uh, becomes a cone, right? And becomes a cone, which is actually a very simple cone. It's sort of like an r greater than or equal to zero, or actually r strictly greater than zero to the number of edges, right? So for, you know, and sometimes, so for example, here I've done this example where this is a tropical curve of genus one with two mark points that looks like a candy, right? And it has two edges that I've, you know, that can have lengths x and y. And so if you want to parameterize all curves with this topological type, you got a quadrant, right? The first quadrant in the plane. But then you might say, well, but actually I want to introduce a notion of isomorphism of tropical curves, right? That is, okay, a self-map from the graph to itself that preserves all the structure, right? And then you see that, you know, a curve where x is equal to 5 and y is equal to 7 is certainly isomorphic to y equals to 5 and x equals to 7. And so the parameter space then is the quotient of this quadrant by an involution that is a reflection upon, uh, upon the diagonal axis. Okay? So these tropical curves, they organize themselves, if you fix the topological type, in things that are either cone or quotients of cones by a finite group of symmetry. Oh, also to Great observation. So. I said a second ago, r strictly greater than zero, right? Uh, if you want to keep the topological type the same, then you, you have r greater than or equal to zero. But you know, it makes sense saying, well, what should we do if you want to close up this cone? Well, if an edge becomes zero, you just contract it. And if you happen to contract a loop, then you pop out the genus of the, that vertex by one. Uh, and if you, if when you contract this edge, you bring together two, two, two vertices of genus G1 and G2, you know, you assign genus function G1 plus G2. So, you know, you do exactly the thing that you would want to do if, um, you know, if I were, you know, if it's the first time that you were told, you know, contract an edge, you would do it, right? It's, yeah, right? It's, <laughs> right. So the uh, weights of the... Vertices plus the loops. Plus the number of loop independent loops. Yeah. yeah. That's the first Betty number. Exactly. So this is genus one because they have two vertices of genus zero, but they have one loop. This was genus two because they have one vertex of genus one, one of genus zero, and one. Great. Okay, so then what we want to do, like because we like moduli spaces, okay, if I fix my discrete invariance, so the genus G and the number of mark points, right, then we want to consider the space of all tropical curves, abstract tropical curves of genus G with n mark points. And this is what's called a um, generalized cone complex, which means, again, informally, it's a bunch of cones possibly folded on top of each other and glued along faces. The slightly more um, fancy way to say this is that it's a colimit of a system of cones with maps of cones, right? So for example, this, this M12 trop is going to be a, a, a running example for my whole talk, right? Curves of genus one with two mark points. Um, this is, and it's too bad that Margarita did M20 yesterday, otherwise I could have recycled her example. But, um, but there's exactly one tropical curve that consists just of a vertex with the two hair coming out. Then I have two rays corresponding either to this uh, armless man diving from Acapulco or this uh, garbage bag being tossed off a truck, right? Um, and then I have two two-dimensional cones. One is the one that we've met, which is our, you know, our candy, and the other one is the, the diving man, his, his head became empty, right? And so, uh, and all these cones have maps between them, 
right? There is a map, for example, from this green cone to the face of this two-dimensional cone, because if I contract the head of the, of the man, right, the, the, the loop right here, it becomes a vertex that you have to promote to genus one because I've contracted a loop. Right? And so the limit, like Jorge was pointing out, what should we do if we take the limit is, well, we place this kind of picture. And so, for example, this figure arises the limit both of, of three different degeneration, and so I have three face inclusions. Okay, so then it's it, because this is sort of a burden, burdensome um, thing to write, then it's very common to sort of just write this picture instead, which is once you glue everything else, right, this cone, which is this top cone, looks what it does, and this cone got folded because we are also want to take sort of the quotient by these involutions, and so the map, you know, M1 to TROP looks like this, this sort of flattened, um, you know, union of cones. There is a very dangerous thing if you just think of it this way, and I want, you know, point it out, and then I'll use the, the abusive notation, which is, it's very important, it will be very important, that these cones have a integral lattices in them. Right? This correspond, if we're doing real lengths, to where the edges have int integer lengths. Right? And this is important for questions of intersection theory, for questions of uh, you know, relations to toric geometry, we'll talk in a second. Um, and certainly this, this, this phase inclusion respect these integral structures, so there is no problem there. But, you know, if you see, but, but you know, but there is no way to know, and this is very important, how the integral structure on this cone talks to the integral structure on this cone. In other words, if I come straight down here and I say, oh, this is a vertical line, how does it continue here? We just don't know. It's not information. It's, you know, as I come here, saying it all, oh, just continue like this, might not be the right answer. It looks like a piecewise okay? information. It is a piecewise information, yes. But, you know, it's not, you know, when you draw it like this, it looks like, well, of course, going straight through this green arrow is this. That's not the case, right? I just... I mean, I should not have, the, my point is I should not have drawn it in a plane, right? But, so this is the honest, honest picture, but if every time you wanted to talk about M1 to drop it through this, we'd never do anything about it, right? Cool. Yes, yes, because integral points always, con always um, parameterize edge length, integral edge lengths, right? So it's, yeah. Everywhere we have integral points. We do, you know, we have some partial information of, you know, how this integral structure and these two-dimensional cones talk to each other because there's the gluing along this face, but somehow it's sort of the normal information that we, you know, we don't know how this normal direction relates to this normal direction. That's the... And again, if this is truly the first time you hear about MGN trop, you might want to completely ignore that because it's sort of a, but, um, but this is an important point. Okay. Yeah. So MG and TROP is a, is a cone complex, right? So the cones go on forever and ever and ever, and they're not compact. There's a version where you can compactify the cones at infinite lengths. That's another, that's MG, M bar, G and TROP. Um, but let's talk about it later if you want. Otherwise, I mean, I, there's so many rabbit holes that you can get me into, and then the talk will end there, right? Uh, I would like to get to Herbie's numbers, but yeah, I'm happy to talk about it. Okay. Uh, next thing I want to talk about is if you have a map of cones, right? So a map of cones is, you know, a map induced by a linear map of the corresponding vector spaces in which the cones live, the individual cones live, that preserves integral points. So integral points are mapped to integral points. So if you want, think about it, a matrix with integral coefficients. Um, then there's a notion of a local degree of this map which is, again, the only thing that it could really be is you take the image of the lattice, the integral lattice of your source cone inside the target cone, and you look at the index of this, sub of this red sub-lattice inside this blue lattice. Yes, yes, and absolutely, if the two cones are not of the same dimension, 
right? Then the local degree is zero. The same like push forward as in algebraic geometry, if you push for a cycle and it doesn't have the same, the same dimension, it's zero. And again, if this might ring a bell, if you're familiar with toric geometry, it's exactly that reason that, that you know, explains this degree. But uh, the, again, the point I want to make is that when you, when you compute sort of degree of maps in tropical geometry, you often have to be careful to count sort of, you know, inverse images with local degrees that come from this sort of um, arguments. And again, let me preview why I'm saying this, because last yesterday we introduced Hurwitz numbers as the degree of a branch morphism from a moduli space of covers to a moduli space of branch divisors. Well, the inspiration for Hannah Markvig, when, you know, she came to me and said, you're a Hervis theorist, I need to tropicalize you. Um, her inspiration, her motivation is she wanted to reproduce exactly that kind of argument in the tropical world, in the tropical category. So, hence, tropical moduli spaces, right? So anytime you're given sort of a moduli space that you care about, then, you know, one thing that you can do is you can try to set up a tropical version, right? Um, where essentially the, the tropical objects that you're trying to create should contain possibly all the information about the boundary of the classical objects that you want to quote unquote tropicalize, right? So for example, here my example is, um, let's start with a moduli space of covers from a genus one curve to P1 of degree four, that have two special points, zero and infinity, that are fully ramified, right? And other two points uh, are simply ramified. So this is gonna be one of our favorite, you know, double Hurwitz numbers, right? And so there is an open, dense set inside this moduli space where like, these are covers from smooth curves to be one, no problem. And this is gonna be uh, dimension one, okay? And then I have two types of boundary points where I degenerate my P1 to a chain of two P1s, and I degenerate a, the, a genus two curve to a chain of two rational curves attached nodes, right? So this is the two picture. And now what happens is that, okay, over this node, I can have two possible distinct ramification profiles. I can have a point that is unramified and a point that ramifies to order three, or I can have two points that ramify to order two. So this is my classical moduli space. And so what I do is I, I kind of take the dual graphs of everything that I see on the, on the right. right. And I say, okay, so that my dual graph for this, this object, right, let me actually write it, the dual graph here would just be sort of a vertex with, you know, I, I want to think of two special ends with degree four mapping to a genus one, right? So this is, this is what corresponds to this vertex here, right? And for the two boundary points, instead we get rays. And then the picture I'm gonna draw is exactly these two, these two you know, these kind of candy graphs with their map down to a line. Okay? So there's, there's, at this point, just some analogy, right? In the sense that, um, you know, I have sort of ends that correspond to the special ramification that are labeled with the ramification order four and four. I have ends in the middle that are corresponding to nodes that are also labels with ramification order at the nodes. And then here I had two, exactly two simple ramification points, not coincidentally, I have two trivalent vertices in these graphs. Right? So there's this dictionary starts building itself, right, between sort of some algebraic objects and their tropical counterparts. The tropical moduli space is then now this cone complex consists in two rays joining at a point. Um, it's a little bit tricky when you want to sort of set up a tropical moduli space and you want to actually be able to recover information for the algebraic moduli space is you might need to feed the tropical moduli space some geometric information, right? So tropical geometry doesn't necessarily see everything that you want to count, and this is because, again, tropical geometry at, at heart is a degeneration, and it loses some information. And so there's some weights that need to be set up carefully. So 
which one should think of like multiplicity that are given to um, to the rays. Um, and again, I think I don't want to get into details right now, but I'd be happy to talk to. But in this case, these two weights end up being one, so I could have omitted the discussion. But one of these one happens to be two divided by two. Um, there is a two because this boundary point somehow has algebraic multiplicity two, but then there's a divided by two because there's, there's a stacky structure that counts for one half. Again, if you like this kind of thing, let's chat later. If you don't, ignore it. It's, uh, it's going to be okay. Any question? Yeah. Um, arrows and four, <coughs> two plus two and four. And oh, yeah. Same. Thank you. Is that a coincidence? No, no, no. In fact, that's, that's one of the most important things that I just forgot to say. Uh, some of the structure <coughs> that also one sees here is somehow that if you slice this graph at any, at any point and look at the sum of the degrees, it's always the degree of the map, which is, again, the ana analogous idea that if you take any inverse image of a map of Riemann surfaces, and you count each of the, uh, sorry, any point in the, in the source and take all the inverse images, and you count the points of the fiber with the replication order, you always get the degree. Right? So that's the analogous case. And that entails the fact that these tropical curves with this decoration, with these weights, are what's called uh, harmonic maps or satisfy a balancing condition, also meaning that at every vertex, the sum of these incoming weights is equal to the sum of the output. So we'll come back uh, in a second. I'll, I'll do a second come through this idea when you go we zoom back into the numbers, but this, you can do this for many sort of modular problems related to curves that you can. And where comes information coming in out that was not used before? So why you put arrows on here? Uh, because I'm essentially remembering my zero and infinity. Yeah, and zero and infinity become sort of these two legs on the base curves. And the uh, inverse images of zero infinity will become this infinite pair going off. I remember that we're, we're always trying to take dual graphs, right? So wherever you have points, yeah. On the numbers, it looks like that you put an arrow on this. Because you speak of in and out. Yes. That was not used yes. as structure before. Um, yes. Uh, it's, it, uh, it's, it's just convenient. It's convenient to... Uh, and you, I'll, I'll come back. I'll come back more carefully to this, uh, and, uh, and you'll see. But it, it is just convenient. But let me, I first wanted to get like a very general setup, and then we'll come back to this tropical enumerative problems setup. So again, oftentimes, if you have a classical algebraic geometry enumerative problem that you can phrase in terms of some tautological quantity about some moduli spaces, like in some intersection numbers or some um, degree of some tautological morphism, like we did yesterday for the Hurwitz problem, right? The Hurwitz problem is the degree of some branch morphism from a, a space of covers to some divisor space of P1, right? You can try to do the same thing in this tropical category, right? So you can set up a tropical moduli space, of which we did a little example before. You can set up sort of a tropical version of a space of divisors, to which we'll come back, so don't, don't worry, this is epidermic. Uh, you can have a tropical branch morphism, dots here, right? And you can count, you know, you can hope that you get this to be sort of a map of equidimensional cone complexes with integral structure, and you can count the degree by taking a maximal cone on the base, looking at all the inverse images, counting all of the inverse images with the local multiplicity that I told you, right? And then get a global, deg a well-defined degree and define this to be the tropical version of the numeric problem. Right? So this is the dictionary. Okay? So this was my first kind of, com you know, sort of philosophical come through of like what, you know, we used to do 10, 15 years ago, uh, people that love to do enumerative tropical geometry. Okay. But in the end, it should yeah. just be the arrow degree the quality of these numbers, right? Well, if you're lucky, if you're lucky, then you prove a correspondence theorem. Right? Um, you know, Hannah would have said, I'm already happy if I can do this, because that means that tropical geometry works well as a, as a branch of mathematics. But then, of course, then the na nasty algebraic geometers would be like, well, what is it good for if it doesn't actually compute the right thing? I'm not going to get into this, in, into this argument. Um, 
you know, I, I, you know, I'm, I am an algebraic geometer. I used to be one of these, uh, you know, St. Thomas uh, unfaithfuls, but I've been, I've been properly converted at this point. Okay. And now I want to go back and actually do this, uh, do this program for double Hurwitz numbers. Okay. So for double Hurwitz numbers, tropical covers, the moduli space I want to set up, right, is going to be, be denoted uh, as MG trop. We're just going to do target P1. And I'm going to have an X, right, these ve vectors of ramification profile over zero and infinity. Then I'm going to write as, you know, positive numbers and negative numbers. Right? Again, one way to organize this fact that I want to distinguish positive and negative is to give signs, and it's going to be to give a orientation to my graph, right? So it's going to be the most generic graphs that I'm going to care about, by which I mean I can obtain everything else by contracting edges, right? But the most generic graphs I'm going to care about are going to be trivalent graphs, like this. They're going to have genus G, and all the genus is going to be obtained as loops. There's no, not going to be any genus at vertices. Right? Um, they're going to have a map, an affine linear map to R. By this, I mean that if I take any one of the edges and I like, have a sort of like a, a length parameter, then the map from here to here is you know, AX plus B, where A is a, an integer, right? So integral slopes as well. Okay. And then I'm going to have that over the legs that go to minus infinity, I'm going to put my positive ramification profiles. Over the legs get, that go to plus infinity, I'm going to put my negative ramification profiles. I'm actually going to flip the sign, some weird convention where we say, okay, the minus if all the edges are oriented inwards, and then, you know, I want it. Whatever, that's not important. And then the last thing is I have weights on all the edges, which are precisely the slopes of this linear function that I was telling about. And these weights are integer that satisfy this harmonistic condition, this balancing condition, right? The sum of the weights over each point is always the same, or at every vertex, the sum of incoming weights is equal to the sum of outgoing weights. Okay? So if I look at, you know, for, for a fix G and X, I look at all graphs like this. And then I take all possible edge contractions. And I get myself a cone complex, like a co-limit of cones, right? Because I have all these cones with inclusions, right? I get myself what's called the moduli space of tropical covers. Okay? So, the yeah. The points on the R also, now here, uh, I mean, I could, I could, but I don't have to. But you no. want to say it's a, it's a, it's a, I mean, I mean, I could, right? Uh, right, I, I, right now, I'm not being that sophisticated. I'm not setting up a category of graphs. I'm just saying oh, okay. this is this is the map, uh, you know, an affine linear map with integral slopes. Yeah, there is there's a more refined version to say where this becomes a line graph, so it has vertices, red and left, but we don't need it at this point yet. Uh, again, a, a quick, a quick um, detour is this is one possible moduli space of covers that, um, that I'm telling you about. There is actually a few different variants uh, that one can do it depending on how you set up the theory. So, for example, going back to our previous example, right? If we wanted to do, you know, degree four genus one and we don't allow any end with slope zero, with anything to contract, then we just get two rays, right? But in, you know, if one likes gromov witten theory, right? Stable maps have contracting components. And so one could say, well, tropically, I, can I want to allow that too. Like, I want to allow possibly graphs that get contracted. And then the same sort of moduli space of genus one degree four maps with two ramified points will acquire a two-dimensional cone. Let me show the kind of things that it parameterizes. Oops. Oh, come on. I can do this. No, I cannot do it. Resize. There you go. 
there's a two-dimensional cone, right, that parameterizes maps that, that cover the line with just a line, and then I have this bubble that just contracts to a point. Right? And I have two lengths, the length of this edge and the length of this cycle. And then if I can, I can contract this edge and get down here, or I can contract the cycle and get down here, and that's what this extra cone is. There's a third version called admissible covers that for the sake of time I'm not gonna talk about, but, but the point I'm making is that there's not a unique way to set up these tropical problems, and depending on how you set it up, you'll have to do things a little bit different. It will all have a lattice structure, yes. Okay, so let me stick for the rest of the talk. I'm gonna stick with the, the, the discussion, the, the, the version of moduli space that is allows for the simpler discussion, so no contracting. I don't allow any edges with slope, you know, with slope zero, no contracting things. Okay, okay and then I have, you know, very naturally, a branch morphism, right, in the sense, and this is what you wanted to see earlier, right? I can just say, okay, if I, um, let me go here, back here. If I have a tropical curve mapping to R like this, I can look at the image of my trivalent vertices. This gives me a collection of points on R. Right? Uh, everything here is done up to a global translation, so I can really assume that this first point is zero. And then so this is R minus one points in R, so I have a map right, from my moduli space of covers to a cone, which is a positive R, to the number of vertices minus one. And now in this case of M1 trop 44, I had two vertices, and so this goes to R greater than zero. Now, one thing that I have not quite said, right, is, I mean, I said, yes, yes, there is an integral structure here, but it's actually, it's a little bit subtle, right, because you know, I have two natural maps for my moduli space of covers, right? The one that sort of maps to the branch sort of um, divisor, and then I have a source morphism. Like I can just say, what if I forget about the cover and just, and just remember the tropical curves that I'm talking about, right? And remember that these were these sort of candy curves, right? And so this map into M12 trop, but these are rays, these are one dimensional. And why are they one dimensional? Well, because the lengths of these two, let me go back here again, the lengths of these two edges are not, cannot vary freely. Because I have to have this map of, with slope two, and they have to map the two endpoints to the same two endpoints. So this has to be the same length as this. And this one has to be one third of this. Right? So I'm actually mapping to M12 as rays with different slopes, given by this ratio of these numbers. And so, the natural thing, the natural way to induce an integral structure in this moduli space is to induce it from M1 to drop. And so, here this first point will correspond to the curve with sort of uh, one, le one length equals to three and the other one, and here to length one, one. Great, but now, okay, let me, let me again look at what I see here, right? I see a branch morphism, which is a map of cone complexes with integral structures. These cone complexes are equidimensional. And so I can define a degree, a notion of degree, by taking, let's take a maximal cone, in this case I have only one, look at its inverse images, and count each of the inverse images with the local degree, right? And what I get in this case, right, well, what happens in this, in, for, I have two cones, the cone with slopes three and one, right? And the integral point here, right, corresponds to the curve where this, actually, let me write it because this is important, this integral point here, so it's green, corresponds to the curve that has this length equal to one and this length equals to three. Right? Because then the map 
3 times x is equal to the map, you know, 1 times x2, right, at the two endpoints. And so it will map, right, this point, which is the first point in the integral structure of the space of covers, to my point 3 via the branch morphism, right? Because I can either take the map 3x and evaluate at 1, or I can take the map y and evaluate at 3. Right? That's what you get. Right? And so this lattice index is 3. Right, which, by the way, you can compute it as some determinant of some matrix. Again, maybe let's not get in too much in detail, right? And not me? No. No, okay. All right. Um, and so I have two cones. This one will give me local degree 3, and this will give me local degree 2. And so my Hurwitz number, my tropical Hurwitz number, in this case, in this particular case, is going to be 3 plus 2, 5. So this is going to be my definition of the tropical Hurwitz numbers. Now, if we do this in general, right, and I've shown you one example, but hopefully you can believe me, that you can define this um, notion of tropical Hurwitz numbers, and we'll have this algorithm that will say, take all these graphs of the type that I introduced back here, right here. All graphs that look like this. Trivalent, ordered, with a map, blah, 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 right? And count them, but weight each of these graphs with the product of the weights of the internal edges divided by the automorphism of the graphs, right? Let's go back and check that this worked, right? So we counted this graph with 3 times 1, and we counted this graph with 2 times 2 divided by 2 because the fact they have the same weight allows me to flip the edges. So this was the development of tropical Hurwitz numbers, right? And um, then, of course, there's a theorem that we proved, you know, 10, 15 years ago with, with Hannah and Paul um, that says tropical Hurwitz numbers agree with classical Hurwitz numbers. So again, if you're a tropical geometry hater, you can say, I don't care about tropical Hurwitz numbers, but still you should care that we developed an algorithm to compute Hurwitz numbers, to compute algebraic Hurwitz numbers. Okay, so yeah, so let me show you some examples. So one example, right, if I look at genus one, degree three with two full ramification points and two um, simply Simple ramification. The only cones that I need to count, the only graphs that I need to count is this candy graph with multiplicity 2 times 1. And so this service number is 2. Okay. And again, this is, you know, if you're bored with my talk, this is a very simple, anything in degree 3, you can count it by counting monodromy representations, right? And you can do it in your head and you can check it's 2. Right? But now you can ask, okay, well, is this algorithm a really efficient way to count Hervis numbers? Like, if you want to count, uh, you know, Hervis number of degree 27 and, you know, some arbitrary ramification, are you going to start drawing this, you know, these trees? You know, and the answer is God, no, right? It's, it's, it's a very complex algorithm. It's very complicated. But sort of one of the advantages that it has is that it shows uh, some structural properties of Hervis numbers. Right? So, for example we can witness piecewise polynomiality in a very simple way, right? And so let me, again, show it by, by one simple example, and then I'll say how this thing generalizes, right? So suppose that instead of doing 3, 3, now I say, okay, let me think of this fully ramified condition as a variable, as d and minus d. Right? In that case, right, the graphs that I need to count are these, right, where I don't have one of them anymore, but I have roughly d over 2, right? Because I can really put any weight i on one end and any weight d minus i on the other. And I need to count each of them with weight i times d minus i. So altogether, I can obtain my double, my, my double Hurwitz numbers as taking one half of the sum from i to d minus 1 of this expression that ends up being d cubed minus d divided by 12, which is a polynomial in d, right? So what has happened? Why is this a polynomial in d, and why does it have the right degree as predicted by Gulden, Jackson, and Vakil? Because what we're doing here, right, 
we have a polynomial function in, in the entries of my, um, my ramification profiles. And uh, G additional parameters, I have an I corresponding factor, I'm doing genus one I'm on one loop. And I'm integrating, I'm doing a discrete integral of this polynomial function over a polytope of dimension G. Again, in this case, the polytope of dimension G is the segment one to D minus one. And so now, uh, Erhard theory will tell me, right, that if I now let the hyperplanes that bound the polytope breathe, right, this discrete integral will be polynomial in the bounds of the hyperplanes, so long as the, the type of the polytope does not change. Right? So why, why does polynomiality happen? Uh, you know, something that could happen is that I have Oops. Some polytope that, you know, I'm just drawing a part that looks like this, right? And then I'm, I'm, making my, I'm making my hyperplanes breathe, right? And at some point, when I go to a certain value, right, my, my, the shape of my top polytope changes, right? So this, this horizontal hyperplane hides behind, ends up behind the vertex, and so instead of seeing sort of a, a quadrangle kind of part, I see a triangle kind of point, right? And um, her theory tells you, yeah, okay, if, that's, if that happens, then, then polynomiality is broken, right? And so that's how polyno piecewise polynomiality happens in double Hurwitz numbering, right? So you can, again, in general genus G, you can set, it, set up carefully the, the double Hurwitz count tropically, and you see it will be a finite sum of uh, integrals over polytopes, and so it will remain polynomial for as long as these polytopes do not change their shape. Okay. And um, it is also, let me see how many, yeah, this is my last slide, so I, I have time to, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So this, this, these things will be with, will sort of be bound by this. Will be sort of summation of x i times some coefficients equals some some k, right? And as you vary the and you vary the k. Okay. So the last thing I want to show, since I have a little bit of time about this tropical algorithm, is how, again, in a simple example, how wall crossings happen in this case, right? And so. Let me consider simple example. Let me consider H zero, X one, X two, X three, X four. And this will have two bases. Right, so these are degree, whatever it is. <laughs> I can't tell it from here. But Hurwitz numbers, um, where the base, the, the source curve is genus zero, the base curve is genus zero. I mean, the, the kind of classical picture they should think about are something like this, possibly for ramification profile. Right. So tropically, I have four graphs. Sorry, I have graphs that um, need to have four ends labeled x1, x2, x3, and x4, and I have to connect them with trivalent vertices. And I have to spread them over a line. So, okay, if I want to spread them over a line, I cannot do it unless I tell you something about the xi's. Right? And that's why it's not polynomial, it's thesis polynomial. So let's make some choices. Let's say that x1 is greater than zero and it's very, very large. Uh, x2 is greater than zero, but it's tiny, right? And x3 and x4 are negative and medium sized. Okay? With this kind of information, you know, of course, 
you can say, okay, what is this information? This is information about the sign of the sum of any, every possible subset of the indices, right? But with this information, I can say, okay, now I can be very precise and this, because I know that x1 and x2 are on this side, x3 and x4 are on this side, and I have two trivalent vertices to spend to get from one to the other. So one thing that I can do, I can certainly just join x1 and x2, get x3 and x4, and so here I have x1 plus x2. This is one possible tropical cover. Or I can first split and then join, right? But because x1 is the big guy, it's only x1 that can sort of donate some of its degree, right? To x3 or x4, right? So I have two pictures, I'm on x2, x3 and x4, where this is x1 plus x3. Remember that x3 is negative, so it's really like subtracting something from x1. Or, let's see, maybe right here, x1, x2, x4, x3. This is x1 plus x4. Okay. And so my double Hermes number, I need to count this graph with this multiplicity, this graph with this multiplicity, this graph with this multiplicity, I get um, 3x1 plus x2 plus x3 plus x4, but I'm subject to the relation that the sum of the xi is zero, right? And so this is 2x1. So this is my double Hervis number in this case. And I say, okay, let me start moving around this, this, these things until I cross some walls. Right? Maybe uh, x1 starts shrinking until it becomes just as large as x3. Right? So let's suppose let's cross the wall. x1 plus x3 equals 0. Right? So on this side, I have the x1 plus x3 is positive. On the other side, I'm going to have x1 plus x3 is negative. And I say, okay, what changes here? Well, luckily, and this is where this gives us a, a pretty good advantage of other techniques, a lot of graphs don't care about crossing this wall. Okay, so I can, the only graphs that are going to care that I'm crossing this wall is graphs that have an end precisely below x1 plus x3. Because this weight is going to become negative. That's not allowed. Right? So I need to sort of like, if I want to understand the wall crossing, I only need to understand what happens in this situation. So this graph disappears. This is no longer allowed. And the graph that is replaced with, now if x1 is, becomes all of a sudden smaller than x3, x1 can no longer donate water. Right? But it has to sort of uh, you know, x1 needs to be helped out to have enough water to, to give to x3, right? So, and so this x1 plus x3 now becomes x2 plus x4, okay? And now, coincidentally, x1 and x3 and x2 and x4 are the same number in absolute value, right? So the, the wall crossing, if I subtract, they're the same number in absolute value, but they're always the opposite number, right? Because x1 plus x2 plus x3 plus x4 is zero. If this one is positive, this is negative. And so I said, well, so what happened when I do the wall crossing formula, so I take the polynomial in the first chamber minus the polynomial in the other chamber, well, all the, the graphs that appear on both sides cancel. This graph gets replaced by this, which means that you know, I have to consider this weight minus this weight. And so I get twice this weight. So the wall crossing right, is two. Wall crossing formula 
is 2 times um, x1 plus x3. Okay. Uh, and, you know, where are the, you know, in my, in, so this is delta. This is my r choose r1, r2 from yesterday. In this case, this example is so simple that I do not see my two Hurwitz numbers because the two Hurwitz numbers in this case would be sort of one is this one and the other is this one. They're genus zero, three-pointed Hurwitz numbers are all one. Okay? But in general, you can see how like this argument generalizes. And in genus zero, how simple it becomes, right? Because you're, to compute a wall crossing, <coughs> You're going to find, in, you know, identify all the graphs that contain an edge with the weight exactly equal to the equation of wall. If you cut this edge, you know, the two sides will be a bunch of graphs that compute Hurwitz numbers. Okay. And then you set up really a bijective proof. And there's a bijection between, you know, these graphs, these, these pairs of graphs that you get and the pairs of graphs that you, that, that you um, use to compute the two Hurwitz numbers on the side, plus there's a choice of how to order, you know, each of these graphs will have their own total order of the vertices, right? But you want to, you know, but, but if you've disconnected, you don't know how to make the two total orders talk, and so you want int to introduce the information of how the total order, orders of the vertices merge, and that's how this sort of binomial coefficient comes out. Again, if you, I don't expect you to be able to follow a rambling combinatorial argument, but I hope what, what, what came out clearly is that it's all of a sudden this wall crossing you know, formula that was a pretty hard work in geometry has become you know, a, a combinatorial exercise. Exactly one edge is changing if you go across one only one wall, right? So that's the key thing. So wrapping up, right? So we have developed this, this combinatorial tool to understand Hurwitz numbers that you know is able to sort of witness and combinatorialize some of the structural aspects of Hurwitz theory. What I want to do um, later this afternoon is say, okay, but now let's connect again back to geometry. You know, at this point, this seems to be completely unrelated to geometry. We've left the world of geometry and landed squarely into combinatorics. Um, in fact, uh, there is this recent perspective of uh, studying sort of uh, uh, the moduli space of curves from the perspective of logarithmic geometry uh, that shows that all these combinatorial gadgets actually have a geometric meaning. So my goal for this afternoon is, um, again, assuming that uh, none of you have seen any logarithmic geometry and apologizing to the people that have, uh, explain what my intuition is about that. Thank you very much. Thank you.